The Great Controversy, Chapter 15 The Bible and the French Revolution In the 16th century, the Reformation, presenting an open Bible to the people, had sought admission to all the countries of Europe. Some nations welcomed it with gladness, as a messenger of heaven. In other lands, the papacy succeeded to a great extent in preventing its entrance. In the light of Bible knowledge, with its elevating influences, was almost wholly excluded. In one country, though the light found entrance, it was not comprehended by the darkness. For centuries, truth and error struggled for the mastery. At last, the evil triumphed, and the truth of heaven was thrust out. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light. The nation was left to reap the results of the course which she had chosen. The restraint of God's Spirit was removed from a people that had despised the gift of His grace. Evil was permitted to come to maturity, and all the world saw the fruit of willful rejection of the light. The war against the Bible, carried forward for so many centuries in France, culminated in the scenes of the Revolution. That terrible outbreaking was but the legitimate result of Rome's suppression of the Scriptures. It presented the most striking illustration which the world has ever witnessed of the working out of the papal policy, an illustration of the results to which for more than a thousand years the teaching of the Roman Church had been tending. The suppression of the scriptures during the period of papal supremacy was foretold by the prophets, and the revelator points also to the terrible results that were to occur especially to France from the domination of the man of sin. Said the angel of the Lord, the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months, and I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand, two hundred, and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. The periods here mentioned forty and two months, and a thousand two hundred and threescore days, are the same, alike representing the time in which the Church of Christ was to suffer oppression from Rome. The 1260 years of papal supremacy began in AD 538 and would therefore terminate in 1798. At that time, a French army entered Rome and made the Pope a prisoner and he died in exile. Though a new Pope was soon afterward elected, the papal hierarchy has never since been able to wield the power which it before possessed. The persecution of the Church did not continue throughout the entire period of the 1260 years. God, in mercy to his people, cut short the time of their fiery trial. In foretelling the great tribulation to befall the Church, the Saviour said, Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Through the influence of the Reformation, the persecution was brought to an end prior to 1798. 
Concerning the two witnesses, the prophet declares further, These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Thy word, said the psalmist, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The two witnesses represent the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament. Both are important testimonies to the origin and perpetuity of the law of God. Both are witnesses also to the plan of salvation. The types, sacrifices, and prophecies of the Old Testament point forward to a Savior to come. The Gospels and Epistles of the New Testament tell of a Savior who has come in the exact manner foretold by type and prophecy. They shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. During the greater part of this period, God's witnesses remained in a state of obscurity. The papal power sought to hide from the people the word of truth and set before them false witnesses to contradict its testimony. When the Bible was proscribed by religious and secular authority, when its testimony was perverted and every effort made that men and demons could invent to turn the minds of the people from it, when those who dared proclaim its sacred truths were hunted, betrayed, tortured, buried in dungeon cells, martyred for their faith, or compelled to flee to mountain fastnesses and to dens and caves of the earth. Then the faithful witnesses prophesied in sackcloth. Yet they continued their testimony throughout the entire period of 1260 years. In the darkest times there were faithful men who loved God's word, and who were jealous for his honor. To these loyal servants were given wisdom, power, and authority to declare his truth during the whole of this time. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Men cannot without impunity trample upon the word of God. The meaning of this fearful denunciation is set forth in the closing chapter of the Revelation. I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy. God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Such are the warnings which God has given to God men against changing in any manner that which he has revealed or commanded. These solemn denunciations apply to all who, by their influence, lead men to regard lightly the law of God. They should cause those to fear and tremble who flippantly declare it a matter of little consequence whether we obey God's law or not. All who exalt their own opinions above divine revelation. All who would change the plain meaning of Scripture to suit their own convenience or for the sake of conforming to the world are taking upon themselves a fearful responsibility. The written word, the law of God, will measure the character of every man and condemn all whom this unerring test shall declare wanting. When they shall have finished or are finished their testimony. The period when the two witnesses were to prophesy clothed in sackcloth ended in 1798. As they were approaching the termination of their work in obscurity, war was to be made upon them by the power represented as the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. 
In many of the nations of Europe, the powers that ruled in church and state had for centuries been controlled by Satan through the medium of the papacy. But here is brought to view a new manifestation of satanic power. It had been Rome's policy under a profession of reverence for the Bible to keep it locked up in an unknown tongue and hidden away from the people. Under her rule, the witnesses prophesied clothed in sackcloth. But another power, the beast from the bottomless pit, was to arise to make open a vowed war upon the word of God. The great city, in whose streets the witnesses are slain, and where their dead bodies lie, is spiritually Egypt. Of all nations presented in Bible history, Egypt most boldly denied the existence of the living God and resisted his commands. No monarch ever ventured upon more open and high-handed rebellion against the authority of heaven than did the king of Egypt. When the message was brought him by Moses in the name of the Lord, Pharaoh proudly answered, Who is Jehovah? that I should hearken unto his voice to let Israel go. I know not Jehovah, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. This is atheism, and the nation represented by Egypt would give voice to a similar denial of the claims of the living God and would manifest a like spirit of unbelief and defiance. The great city is also compared spiritually to Sodom. The corruption of Sodom in breaking the law of God was especially manifested in licentiousness, and this sin was also to be a preeminent characteristic of the nation that should fulfill the specifications of this scripture. According to the words of the prophet, then, a little before the year 1798, some power of satanic origin and character would rise to make war upon the Bible. And in the land where the testimony of God's two witnesses should thus be silenced, there would be manifest the atheism of the pharaoh, and the licentiousness of Sodom. This prophecy has received a most exact and striking fulfillment in the history of France. During the revolution in 1793, the world for the first time heard an assembly of men born and educated in civilization and assuming the right to govern one of the finest of the European nations, uplift their united voice to deny the most solemn truth which man's soul receives, and renounce unanimously the belief and worship of a deity. France is the only nation in the world concerning which the authentic record survives that, as a nation, she lifted her hand in open rebellion against the author of the universe. Plenty of blasphemers, plenty of infidels there have been and still continue to be in England, Germany, Spain and elsewhere. But France stands apart in the world's history as the single state which by the decree of her legislative assembly pronounced that there was no God, and of which the entire population of the capital, and a vast majority elsewhere, women as well as men, danced and sang with joy in accepting the announcement. France presented also the characteristics which especially distinguished Sodom. During the revolution there was manifest a state of moral debasement and corruption similar to that which brought destruction upon the cities of the plain. And the historian presents together the atheism and the licentiousness of France as given in the prophecy. Intimately connected with these laws affecting religion 
was that which reduced the union of marriage, the most sacred engagement which human beings can form and the permanence of which leads most strongly to the consolidation of society, to the state of a mere civil contract of a transitory character, which any two persons might engage in and cast loose at pleasure. If fiends had set themselves to work to discover a mode of most effectually destroying whatever is vulnerable, graceful, or permanent in domestic life, and of obtaining at the same time an assurance that the mischief which it was their object to create should be perpetuated from one generation to another, they could not have invented a more effectual plan than the degradation of marriage. Sofri Arnault, an actress famous for the witty things she said, described the Republican marriage as the sacrament of adultery. Where also our Lord was crucified, this specification of the prophecy was also fulfilled by France. In no land had the spirit of enmity against Christ been more strikingly displayed. In no country had the truth encountered more bitter and cruel opposition. In the persecution which France had visited upon the confessors of the gospel, she had crucified Christ in the person of his disciples. Century after century, the blood of the saints had been shed. While the Waldenses laid down their lives upon the mountains of Piedmont for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ, Similar witness to the truth had been borne by their brethren, the Albigenses of France. In the days of the Reformation, its disciples had been put to death with horrible tortures. Kings and nobles, high-born women and delicate maidens, the pride and the chivalry of the nation, had feasted their eyes upon the agonies of the martyrs of Jesus. The brave Huguenots, battling for those rights which the human heart holds most sacred, had poured out their blood on many a hard-fought field. The Protestants were counted as outlaws, a price was set upon their heads, and they were hunted down like wild beasts. The church in the desert, the few descendants of the ancient Christians that still lingered in France in the 18th century, hiding away in the mountains of the south, still cherished the faith of their fathers, as they ventured to meet by night on mountainside or lonely moor. They were chased by dragoons and dragged away to lifelong slavery in the galleries. The purest, the most refined, and the most intelligent of the French were chained in horrible torture amidst robbers and assassins. Others, more mercifully dealt with, were shot down in cold blood as, unarmed and helpless, they fell upon their knees in prayer. Hundreds of aged men, defenseless women and innocent children were left dead upon the earth at their place of meeting. In traversing the mountainside or the forest where they had been accustomed to assemble, it was not unusual to find at every four places, dead bodies dotting the sward and corpses hanging suspended from the trees. Their country laid waste with the sword, the axe, the faggot, was converted into one vast gloomy wilderness. These atrocities were enacted in no dark age, but in the brilliant era of Louis the Fourth. Letters flourished, the divines of the court and of the capital were learned and eloquent men and greatly affected the graces of meekness and charity. But blackest in the black catalogue of crime, most horrible among the fiendish deeds of all the dreadful centuries, was the St. Bartholomew Massacre. The world still recalls with shuddering horror the scenes of that most cowardly and cruel onslaught. The King of France, urged on by Romish priests and prelates, lent his sanction to the dreadful work. 
a bell tolling at dead of night was a signal for the slaughter. Protestants by thousands, sleeping quietly in their homes, trusting to the plighted honour of their king, were dragged forth without a warning and murdered in cold blood. As Christ was the invisible leader of his people from Egyptian bondage, so was Satan the unseen leader of his subjects in this horrible work of multiplying martyrs. For seven days the massacre was continued in Paris, the first three with inconceivable fury. And it was not confined to the city itself, but by special order of the king was extended to all the provinces and towns where Protestants were found. Neither age nor sex was respected. Neither the innocent babe nor the man of grey hairs was spared. Noble and peasant, old and young, mother and child were cut down together. Throughout France, the butchery continued for two months. Seventy thousand of the very flower of the nation perished. When the news of the massacre reached Rome, the exultation among the clergy knew no bounds. The Cardinal of Lorraine rewarded the messenger with a thousand crowns. The canon of Saint Angelo thundered forth a joyous salute, and bells rang out from every steeple. Bonfires turned night into day, and Gregory the Thirteenth attended by the cardinals and other ecclesiastical dignitaries, went in long procession to the church of St. Louis, where the Cardinal of Lorraine chanted a teardom. A medal was struck to commemorate the massacre, and in the Vatican may still be seen three fire scores of Vasaria describing the attack upon the admiral, the king in council plotting the massacre, and the massacre itself. Gregory sent Charles the Golden Rose, and four months after the massacre, he listened complacently to the sermon of a French priest who spoke of that day so full of happiness and joy when the Most Holy Father received the news and went in solemn state to render thanks to God and St. Louis. The same master spirit that urged on the St. Bartholomew massacre led also in the scenes of the revolution. Jesus Christ was declared to be an impostor, and the rallying cry of the French infidels was, Crush the wretch, meaning Christ. Heaven daring blasphemy and abominable wickedness went hand in hand in the basis of men the most abandoned monsters of cruelty and vice were most highly exalted. In all this supreme homage was paid to Satan, while Christ, in his characteristics of truth, purity, and unselfish love, was crucified. The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. The atheistical power that ruled in France during the revolution and the reign of terror did wage such a war against God and his holy word as the world had never witnessed. The worship of the deity was abolished by the National Assembly. Bibles were collected and publicly burned with every possible manifestation of scorn. The law of God was trampled underfoot. The institutions of the Bible were abolished. The weekly rest day was set aside, and in its stead, every tenth day was devoted to reveling and blasphemy. Baptism and the communion were prohibited, and announcements posted conspicuously over the burial places declared death to be an eternal sleep. The fear of God was said to be so far from the beginning of wisdom that it was the beginning of folly. 
all religious worship was prohibited except that of liberty and the country. The constitutional Bishop of Paris was brought forward to play the principal part in the most impudent and scandalous farce ever acted in the face of a national representation. He was brought forward in full procession to declare to the convention that the religion which he had taught so many years was, in every respect, a piece of priestcraft which had no foundation either in history or sacred truth. He disowned in solemn and explicit terms the existence of the deity to whose worship he had been consecrated and devoted himself in future to the homage of liberty, equality, virtue and morality. He then laid on the table his Episcopal decorations and received a fraternal embrace from the president of the convention. Several apostate priests followed the example of this prelate. And they that dwelt upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Infidel France had silenced the reproving voice of God's two witnesses. The word of truth lay dead in her streets, and those who hated the restrictions and requirements of God's law were jubilant. Men publicly defied the King of Heaven. Like the sinners of old, they cried, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? With blasphemous boldness, almost beyond belief, one of the priests of the new order said, God, if you exist, avenge your injured name. I bid you defiance. You remain silent. You dare not launch your thunders. Who after this will believe in your existence? What an echo is this of the Pharaoh's demand. Who is Jehovah that I should obey his voice? I know not Jehovah. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And the Lord declares concerning the perverters of the truth, their folly shall be manifest unto all. After France had renounced the worship of the living God, the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, it was only a little time till she descended to degrading idolatry by the worship of the goddess of reason in the person of a profligate woman. And this in the representative assemblies of the nation and by its highest civil and legislative authorities, says the historian. One of the ceremonies of this insane time stands unrivaled for absurdity, combined with impiety. The doors of the convention were thrown open to a band of musicians, preceded by whom the members of the municipal body entered in solemn procession singing a hymn in praise of liberty and escorting as the object of their future worship a veiled female whom they termed the goddess of reason. Being brought within the bar, she was unveiled with great form and placed on the right of the president when she was generally recognized as a dancing girl of the opera. To this person, as the fittest representative of that reason whom they worshipped, the National Convention of France rendered public homage. This impious and ridiculous mummery had a certain fashion, and the installation of the goddess of reason was renewed and imitated throughout the nation in such places where the inhabitants desired to show themselves equal to all the heights of the revolution. Said the orator who introduced the worship of reason, Legislators, fanaticism has given way to reason. 
Its bleared eyes could not endure the brilliancy of the light. This day, an immense concourse has assembled beneath those Gothic vaults, which, for the first time, re-echoed the truth. There the French have celebrated the only true worship, that of liberty, that of reason. There we have formed wishes for the prosperity of the arms of the Republic. There we have abandoned inanimate idols for reason, for that animated image, the masterpiece of nature. When the goddess was brought into the convention, the orator took her by the hand and turning to the assembly said, Mortals, cease to tremble before the powerless thunders of a god whom your fears have created. Henceforth, acknowledge no divinity but reason. I offer you its noblest and purest image. If you must have idols, sacrifice only to such as this. Fall before the august senate of freedom. Oh, veil of reason. The goddess, after being embraced by the president, was mounted on a magnificent car and conducted amid an immense crowd to the cathedral of Notre Dame to take the place of the deity. There she was elevated on the high altar and received the adoration of all present. This was followed not long afterward by the public burning of the Bible. On one occasion, the popular society of the museum entered the hall of the municipality exclaiming, Vive la raison! and carrying on the top of a pole the half-burned remains of several books, among others, breveries, missiles, and the old and New Testaments, which expiated in a great fire, said the President, all the fulleries which they have made the human race commit. It was popery that had begun the work which atheism was completing. The policy of Rome had brought out those conditions, social, political, and religious, they were hurrying France on to ruin. Writers in referring to the horrors of the revolution say that these excesses are to be charged upon the throne and the church. In strict justice, they are to be charged upon the church. Popery had poisoned the minds of kings against the Reformation as an enemy to the crown, an element of discord that would be fatal to the peace and harmony of the nation. It was the genius of Rome that by this means inspired the direct cruelty and the most galling oppression which proceeded from the throne. The spirit of liberty went with the Bible. Wherever the gospel was received, the minds of the people were awakened. They began to cast off the shackles that had held them bond slaves of ignorance, vice, and superstition. They began to think and act as men, Monarchs saw it and trembled for their despotism. Rome was not slow to inflame their jealous fears. Said the Pope to the Regent of France in 1525, This mania, Protestantism, will not only confound and destroy religion, but all principles, nobility, laws, orders, and ranks besides. A few years later, a papal noncho warned the king, Sire, be not deceived. The Protestants will upset all civil as well as religious order. The throne is in as much danger as the altar. The introduction of a new religion must necessarily introduce a new government. And theologians appealed to the prejudices of the people by declaring that the Protestant doctrine entices men away to novelties and follies 
It robs the king of the devoted affection of his subjects and devastates both church and state. Thus, Rome succeeded in arraying France against the Reformation. It was to uphold the throne, preserve the nobles, and maintain the laws that the sword of persecution was first unsheathed in France. Little did the rulers of the land foresee the results of that fearful policy. The teaching of the Bible would have implanted in the minds and hearts of the people those principles of justice, temperance, truth, equity, and benevolence which are the very cornerstone of a nation's prosperity. Righteousness exalteth a nation, thereby the throne is established. The work of righteousness shall be peace, in the effect, quietness and assurance, forever. He who obeys the divine law will most truly respect and obey the laws of his country. He who fears God will honour the king in the exercise of all just and legitimate authority. But unhappy France prohibited the Bible and banned its disciples. Century after century, men of principle and integrity, men of intellectual acuteness and moral strength, who had the courage to avow their convictions and the faith to suffer for their truth. For centuries, these men toiled as slaves in the galleries, perished at the stake, or rotted in dungeon cells. Thousands upon thousands found safety in flight, and this continued for 250 years after the opening of the Reformation. Scarcely was there a generation of Frenchmen during that long period that did not witness the disciples of the gospel fleeing before the insane fury of the persecutor and carrying with them the intelligence, the arts, the industry, the order in which, as a rule, they preeminently excelled to enrich the lands in which they found an asylum and in proportion as they replenished other countries with these good gifts, did they empty their own of them. If all that was now driven away had been retained in France, if, during these three hundred years, the industrial skill of the exiles had been cultivating her soil, if, during these three hundred years, their artistic bent had been improving her manufacturers, if, during these three hundred years, their creative genius and analytic power had been enriching her literature and cultivating her science, if their wisdom had been guiding her counsels, their bravery fighting her battles, their equity framing her laws, and the religion of the Bible strengthening the intellect and governing the conscience of her people. What a glory! would at this day have encompassed France. What a great, prosperous and happy country, a pattern to the nations, would she have been. But a blind and inexorable bigotry chased from her soil every teacher of virtue, every champion of order, every honest defender of the throne. It said to the men who would have made their country a renown and glory in the earth, Choose which you will have, a stake or exile. At last the ruin of the state was complete. There remained no more conscience to be prescribed, no more religion to be dragged to the stake, no more patriotism to be chased into banishment. And the revolution, with all its horrors, was the dire result. With the flight of the Huguenots, a general decline settled upon France. Flourishing manufacturing cities fell into decay. Fertile districts returned to their native wilderness. Intellectual dullness and moral declension succeeded a period of unwanted progress. Paris became one vast almshouse. And it is estimated that, at the breaking out of the revolution, 200,000 paupers claimed charity from the hands of the king. 
The Jesuits alone flourished in the decaying nation and ruled with dreadful tyranny over churches and schools, the prisons and the galleys. The gospel would have brought to France the solution of those political and social problems that baffled the skill of her clergy, her king and her legislators and finally plunged the nation into anarchy and ruin. But under the domination of Rome, the people had lost the Saviour's blessed lessons of self-sacrifice and unselfish love. They had been led away from the practice of self-denial for the good of others. The rich had found no rebuke for their oppression of the poor. The poor no help for their servitude and degradation. The selfishness of the wealthy and powerful grew more and more apparent and oppressive. For centuries the greed and profligation of the noble resulted in grinding extortion toward the peasant. The rich wronged the poor, and the poor hated the rich. In many provinces the estates were held by the nobles, and the labouring classes were only tenants. They were at the mercy of their landlords, and were forced to submit to their exorbitant demands. The burden of supporting both the church and the state fell upon the middle and lower classes, who were heavily taxed by the civil authorities and by the clergy. The pleasure of the nobles was considered the supreme law. The farmers and the peasants might starve for aught their oppressors cared. The people were compelled at every turn to consult the exclusive interests of the landlord. The lives of the agricultural labourers were lives of incessant work and unrivalled misery. Their complaints, if they ever dared to complain, were treated with insolent contempt. The courts of justice would always listen to a noble as against a peasant. Bribes were notoriously accepted by the judge, and the merest caprice of the aristocracy had the force of law by virtue of this system of universal corruption. Of the taxes wrung from the commonality by the secular magnates on the one hand and the clergy on the other, not half ever found its way into the royal or episcopal treasury. The rest was squandered in profligate self-indulgence, and the men who thus impoverished their fellow subjects were themselves exempt from taxation and entitled by law or custom to all the appointments of the state. The privileged classes numbered 150,000, and for their gratification, millions were condemned to hopeless and degrading lives. The court was given up to luxury and profligacy. There was little confidence existing between the people and the rulers. Superstition fastened upon all the messieurs of the government as designing and selfish. For more than half a century before the time of the revolution, the throne was occupied by Louis XV, who, even in those evil times, was distinguished as an indolent, frivolous and sensual monarch. With a depraved and cruel aristocracy and an improvised and ignorant lower class, the state financially embarrassed and the people exasperated, it needed no prophet's eye to foresee a terrible impending outbreak. To the warnings of his counsellors, the king was accustomed to reply, Try to make things go on as long as I am likely to live. After my death, it may be as it will. It was in vain that the necessity of reform was urged. He saw the evils, but had neither the courage nor the power to meet them. The doom awaiting France was but too truly pictured in his indolent and selfish answer. After me, the deluge! By working upon the jealousy of the kings and the ruling classes, Rome had influenced them to keep the people in bondage, well knowing that the state would thus be weakened, and proposing by this means to fasten both rulers and people in her thrall. 
With far-sighted policy, she perceived that in order to enslave men effectually, the shackles must be bound upon their souls, that the surest way to prevent them from escaping their bondage was to render them incapable of freedom. A thousand-fold more terrible than the physical suffering which resulted from her policy was the moral degradation. Deprived of the Bible and abandoned to the teachings of bigotry and selfishness, the people were shrouded in ignorance and superstition and sunken in vice, so that they were wholly unfitted for self-government. But the outworking of all this was widely different from what Rome had purposed. Instead of holding the masses in a blind submission to her dogmas, her work resulted in making them infidels and revolutionists. Romanism they despised as priestcraft. They beheld the clergy as a party to their oppression. The only god they knew was the god of Rome. Her teaching was their only religion. They regarded her greed and cruelty as the legitimate fruit of the Bible and they would have none of it. Rome had misrepresented the character of God and perverted his requirements, and now men rejected both the Bible and its author. She had required a blind faith in her dogmas under the pretended sanction of the scriptures. In the reaction, Voltaire and his associates cast aside God's word altogether and spread everywhere the poison of infidelity. Rome had ground down the people under her iron heel, and now the masses, degraded and brutalized, in their recoil from her tyranny, cast off all restraint. Enraged at the glittering cheat to which they had so long paid homage, they rejected truth and falsehood together, and mistaking license for liberty, the slaves of vice exulted in their imagined freedom. At the opening of the revolution, by a concession of the king, the people were granted a representation exceeding that of the nobles and the clergy combined. Thus the balance of power was in their hands, but they were not prepared to use it with wisdom and moderation. Eager to redress the wrongs they had suffered, they determined to undertake the reconstruction of society. An outraged populace, whose minds were filled with bitter and long-treasured memories of wrong, resolved to revolutionize the state of misery that had grown unbearable and to avenge themselves upon those whom they regarded as the authors of their sufferings. The oppressed wrought out the lesson they had learned under tyranny and became the oppressors of those who had oppressed them. Unhappy France reaped in blood the harvest she had sown. Terrible were the results of her submission to the controlling power of Rome. Where France, under the influence of Romanism, had set up the first stake at the opening of the Reformation, there the revolution set up its first guillotine. On the very spot where the first martyrs to the Protestant faith were burned in the 16th century. The first victims were guillotined in the 18th. In repelling the gospel, which would have brought her healing, France had opened the door to infidelity and ruin. When the restraints of God's law were cast aside, it was found that the laws of man were inadequate to hold in check the powerful tides of human passion and the nation swept on to revolt and anarchy. The war against the Bible inaugurated an era which stands in the world's history as the reign of terror. Peace and happiness were banished from the homes and hearts of men. No one was secure. He who triumphed today was suspected, condemned tomorrow. Violence and lust held undisputed sway. King, clergy, and nobles were compelled to submit to the atrocities of an excited and maddened people. Their thirst for revenge was only stimulated by the execution of the king, and those who had decreed his death soon followed him to the scaffold. 
a general slaughter of all suspected of hostility to the revolution was determined. The prisons were crowded, at one time containing more than 200,000 captives. The cities of the kingdom were filled with scenes of horror. One party of revolutionists was against another party, and France became a vast field of contending masses, swayed by the fury of their passions. In Paris, one tumult succeeded another, and the citizens were divided into a medley of factions that seemed intent on nothing but mutual extermination. And to add to the general misery, the nation became involved in a prolonged and devastating war with the great powers of Europe. The country was nearly bankrupt. The armies were clamoring for arrears of pay. The Parisians were starving. The provinces were laid waste by brigands, and civilization was almost extinguished in anarchy and license. All too well, the people had learned the lessons of cruelty and torture which Rome had so diligently taught. A day of retribution at last had come. It was not now the disciples of Jesus that were thrust into dungeons and dragged to the stake. Long ago, these had perished or been driven into exile. Unsparing Rome now felt the deadly power of those whom she had trained to delight in deeds of blood. The example of persecution which the clergy of France had exhibited for so many ages was now retorted upon them with signal vigor. The scaffolds ran red with the blood of the priests. The galleys and the prisons, once covered with Huguenots, were now filled with their persecutors. Chained to the bench and toiling at the oar, the Roman Catholic clergy experienced all those woes which their church had so freely inflicted on the gentle heretics. Then came those days when the most barbarous of all codes was administered by the most barbarous of all tribunals. When no man could greet his neighbor or say his prayers without danger of committing a capital crime. When spies lurked in every corner. When the guillotine was long and hard at work every morning. When the jails were filled as close as the holds of a slave ship when the gutters ran foaming with blood into the scene, while the daily wagon loads of victims were carried to their doom through the streets of Paris. The proconsuls, whom the sovereigns committed, had sent forth to the departments, reveled in an extravagance of cruelty unknown even to the capital. The knife of the deadly machine rose and fell, too slow for their work of slaughter. Long rows of captives were mowed down with grape shot. Holes were made in the bottom of crowded barges. Lyons were turned into a desert. At Arras, even the cruel mercy of a speedy death was denied to the prisoners. All down the Lurie, from Samur to the sea, Great flocks of crows and kites feasted on naked corpses, twined together in hideous embraces. No mercy was shown to sex or age. The number of young lads and of girls of seventeen who were murdered by the execrable government is to be reckoned by hundreds. Babies torn from the breast were tossed from pike to pike along the Jacobin ranks. In the short space of ten years, multitudes of human beings perished. All this was as Satan would have it. This was what for ages he had been working to secure. His policy is deception from first to last, and his steadfast purpose is to bring woe and wretchedness upon men, to deface and defile the workmanship of God to mar the divine purposes of benevolence and love, and thus cause grief in heaven. Then, by his deceptive arts, he blinds the minds of men and leads them to throw back the blame of his work upon God, as if all this misery 
were the result of the Creator's plan. In like manner, when those who have been degraded and brutalized through his cruel power achieve their freedom, he urges them on to excesses and atrocities. Then this picture of unbridled license is pointed out by tyrants and oppressors as an illustration of the results of liberty. When error in one garb has been detected, Satan only masks it in a different disguise and multitudes receive it as eagerly as at the first. When the people found Romanism to be a deception, and he could not through this agency lead them to transgression of God's law, he urged them to regard all religion as a cheat, and the Bible as a fable, and casting aside the divine statutes, they gave themselves up to unbridled iniquity. The fatal error which wrought such woe for the inhabitants of France was the ignoring of this one great truth, that true freedom lies within the prescriptions of the law of God. Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments! Then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. There is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Atheists, infidels, and apostates oppose and denounce God's law, but the results of their influence prove that the well-being of man is bound up with his obedience of the divine statutes. Those who will not read the lessons from the book of God are bidden to read it in the history of nations. When Satan wrought through the Roman church to lead men away from obedience, his agency was concealed and his work was so disguised that the degradation and misery which resulted were not seen to be the fruit of transgression. And his power was so far contradicted by the working of the Spirit of God that his purposes were prevented from reaching their full fruition. The people did not trace the effect to its cause and discover the source of their miseries. But in the revolution, the law of God was openly set aside by the National Council. And in the reign of terror which followed, the working of cause and effect could be seen by all. When France publicly rejected God and set aside the Bible, wicked men and spirits of darkness exulted in their attainment of the object so long desired, a kingdom free from the restraints of the law of God. Because sentence against an evil work was not speedily executed, therefore the heart of the sons of men was fully set in them to do evil. But the transgression of a just and righteous law must inevitably result in misery and ruin. Though not visited at once with judgments, the wickedness of men was nevertheless surely working out their doom. Centuries of apostasy and crime had been treasuring up wrath against the day of retribution, and when their iniquity was full, the despisers of God learned too late that it is a fearful thing to have worn out the divine patience. The restraining spirit of God, which imposes a check upon the cruel power of Satan, was in great measure removed, and he whose only delight is in the wretchedness of men was permitted to work his will. Those who had chosen the service of rebellion were left to reap its fruits until the land was filled with crimes too horrible for pen to trace. From devastated provinces and ruined cities, a terrible cry was heard, a cry of bitterest anguish. France was shaken as if by an earthquake. Religion, law, social order, the family, the state, and the church all were smitten down by the impious hand that had been lifted against the law of God. Truly spoke the wise man, the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times 
and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him, but it shall not be well with the wicked. They hated knowledge, and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way, and be filled with their own devices. God's faithful witnesses, slain by the blasphemous power that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, were not long to remain silent. After three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. It was in 1793 that the decrees which abolished the Christian religion and set aside the Bible passed the French assembly. Three years and a half later, a resolution residing these decrees, thus granting toleration to the scriptures, was adopted by the same body. The world stood aghast at the enormity of guilt which had resulted from a rejection of the sacred oracles, and men recognized the necessity of faith in God and his word as the foundation of virtue and morality. Saith the Lord, whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? And against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? Therefore, behold, I will cause them to know. This once will I cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is Jehovah. Concerning the two witnesses, the prophet declares further, And they heard a great voice from heaven, saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Since France made war upon God's two witnesses, they have been honoured as never before. In 1804, the British and Foreign Bible Society was organised. This was followed by similar organisation with numerous branches, upon the continent of Europe. In 1816, the American Bible Society was founded. When the British Society was formed, the Bible had been printed and circulated in 50 tongues. It has since been translated into many hundreds of languages and dialects. For the 50 years preceding 1792, little attention was given to the work of foreign missions. No new societies were formed and there were but few churches that made any effort for the spread of Christianity in heathen lands. But toward the close of the 18th century, a great change took place. Men became dissatisfied with the results of rationalism and realized the necessity of divine revelation and experimental religion. From this time, the work of foreign missions attained an unprecedented growth. The improvements in printing have given an impetus to the work of circulating the Bible. The increased faculties for communication between different countries, the breaking down of ancient barriers and prejudice and national exclusiveness, and the loss of secular power by the pontiff of Rome have opened the way for the entrance of the Word of God. For some years the Bible has been sold without restraint in the streets of Rome and it has now been carried to every part of the habitable globe. The infidel Voltaire once boastingly said, I am weary of hearing people repeat that twelve men established the Christian religion. I will prove that one man may suffice to overthrow it. Generations have passed since his death. Millions have joined in the war upon the Bible. But it is so far from being destroyed that where there were a hundred in Voltaire's time, there are now 10,000, yes, a hundred thousand copies of the Book of God. In the words of an early reformer concerning the Christian church, the Bible is an anvil that has worn out so many hammers. Saith the Lord, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. The word of our God 
shall stand forever. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. Whatever is built upon the authority of man will be overthrown. But that which is founded upon the rock of God's immutable word shall stand forever.